Welcome to the 86th episode of the Overclock ZA podcast. That's Overclock ZA, just as you say it. That's how you found it. Thank you for joining us. I'm Lindsay Shooters. I'm joined by Gavin Dudley. And I need to start with a couple of heartfelt I am sorry's. Um, first, going to rain.co.za. I, I have tested your service. I am happy with your service. And I've realized that upon further investigation, that any negative comments, like 90% of the negative comments on Hello Peter and like on the internet about rain service right now, like from the beginning of this year, was just because people can't read. So, <laughs> <laughs> what does so that mean? They've kept their, their data speeds on the unlimited package to 10 megabits per second, which is like standard across pretty much all LTE packages right now. Um, you have mm -hmm. unlimited data. They try and serve you 10 megabits per second. Obviously, network contention is an issue there. Um, 10 is perfectly reasonable. I mean, most yeah, things can get done at 10. You know, you can, you can even game at 10. In fact, 10 is what ADSL has been offering us since forever, and everyone is perfectly happy with that. So, you know, fine. Yeah, exactly. okay. So, you, like, had a lot of whining people. It was like, oh, but we used to have, like, 25 megabits per second, 35. And no, now no, no. Kept 10, and this is supposed to be unlimited. That's not unlimited. And they kept the um, streaming video to standard definition or at least substandard definition which is 360p so fuzzy Again, Netflix I mean, is a thing <laughs> no but that's not such a bad trade-off no, i mean for, for really, what you're getting really you know? um the the problem that i've noticed is the streaming services do have some problems like just initializing so especially when you're like chromecast mm. or something like, that, it's like oh crap let's go fetch the stream oh no we can't stream it like that right and then oh they, i see it's just like a, a handoff little problem. Uh. That then seems interesting, like you're serving slower than you actually are, but you really aren't. It's just like in the back. And if you set up, like on the Apple TV, if I set up Showmax and I set it to like the lowest thingy, it works perfectly fine. Um, okay. Yeah, that's, so, that's the first one. The second one, I was horribly wrong about 5G. <laughs> <laughs> okay, which part of 5G were you horribly wrong about? So, for the record, folks, my my catchphrase on 5G is um, people are confused about what 5G is going to do for them that 4G didn't do for them. And the truth is, as these products get launched, we see these outrageous speeds being shown, but we all know the reality is not going to be like that. Okay, so let's hear what Lindsay's discovered in his revelations. Um, yeah. So when it comes to kind of network quality and just being able to handle extreme loads like 5g is far superior to lte i'm experiencing this now as because i've i've switched my home internet connection to lte and i cannot wait for the rain tower that is 200 meters away from my house mm -hmm. to be 5g capable and then i'll get right. myself a 5g router and right. surf at like human speeds instead of because like these because things. rain Technically speaking, Rain was the first network to roll out a 5G network. We were skeptical about it because we didn't yeah. think they had the ca the capacity to do that kind of thing. But it is possible they did. It was a very tiny little footprint. And mm. I think just in order to score points, they claimed to have rolled out the first 5G. And yeah. subsequently, so, Vodacom and now most recently, MTN. So, I mean, if you're on Rain, all you have to do is wait for their footprint to reach you, basically. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, do you know if you're I, in... I are, you, were, are you in... Are you in the RAIN 5G footprint now? No. No, no. I think no. RAIN is still okay. um, limited to like the Gauteng area and like little ah. pockets of Cape Town. But the mm. moment, I mean, this is an actual RAIN tower that they set up with um, city council approval, <laughs> which Telcom are kind of okay. getting into. They need to start uh, in the news this week. Um, Telcom lost a court case and they have to rip down a lot of the towers that they put up in Cape Town. Um, really? Where wow, they, that's a... they had applied for approval, for land use approval, and then they just put the towers up anyway. And now right. um, Dan Plato and City are like, guys, actually, no, that's not how we do things. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, you have to understand the, the cell tower thing is like an ongoing battlefield, basically, between the operators and uh, communities and government. Okay. So... At any one time, the likes of Vodacom will have dozens and dozens of sites to put up towers awaiting approval, either because the community itself objected or government objected or someone objected somewhere. And 
Um, the hippies, I refer to them as bunny huggers, of which my family, <laughs> frankly, is a part, um, are very resistant. They're like, the, ooh, ooh, radio waves are going to kill us, you know, which I personally yeah. don't buy into, but a lot of people do. So there's lots of resistance. People want faster network, more reliable network, cheaper network, but they won't let them build any towers. It's been a bit of a blind that, you know. So at any one time, the likes of MTN and Vodacom are all awaiting um, permission to put up radio towers to, to increase their cellular capacity. Um, obviously, Telcom, being a former state-owned monopoly, presumed it was just going to automatically get <laughs> rights to build these towers, <laughs> which is why it put them up, probably. But so it's sort of a sort of ask for um, uh, ask for forgiveness instead of for permission kind of philosophy. Yeah. But it's a very expensive business to have your tower taken down. So. And this is what makes it life difficult for rain. It has to go through, let's remember um, Vodacom and MTN have got 25 odd years in putting this stuff up. You know, rains like comes yesterday. What they all try and do now is to share infrastructure. So they put up one mast and they put cell C, MTN and Vodacom transceivers and radio uh, transmitters all on the same single mast. So that, that creates a whole range of different problems, but still. Um, we have been poo-pooing rain. Rain started off with a, a burst of great results for everybody, and then they appeared to slide downwards a little bit. If you followed the saga of Lindsay's connectivity, how he struggled to get things going, how Telcom more or less obliged him to move to a wireless system, how he then became disillusioned with the wireless system, and then he moved to rain. So he can't wait for rain to upgrade their portion of the network by his <laughs> kind of house to 5G. Okay, understandably so. Man, okay. <laughs> So I talking mean, about 5G, so, man, MTN yeah. dropped their service uh, two days ago. Um, we were going to go out and have some ice creams on Bloberg Strand uh, because the coverage area in Cape Town is Tableview or that old sort of area around Bloberg, Bloberg yeah. um, which mm. is probably five times as big as, as the Century City boundaries that... <laughs> Sure, sure, sure. True. <laughs> true. It's at the moment. Uh, Gavin, talk us through some speeds and feeds and everything that you have gleaned from the press releases and media that has come out around that. Well, I have been an MTN subscriber for 25 years or however long we've had cellular in the country. I've been with one network because I always believed they were the superior network. Now, there were a couple of reasons for this. One is that I at one stage interviewed quite a lot of their executive um decision makers and managers, and I was very impressed with their technical news. Whereas <clears throat> the likes of Vodacom seem to be spending all their money on rugby teams and all sorts of ad campaigns. MTN was putting its money into the network. It was it the not great way, Gavin. It was the not great Yes, I know. <laughs> but it also turned out that marketing your network in the early days is what got you the market share. So really, Vodacom ended up pulling ahead of MTN just in sheer numbers. And then they started building a fantastic network on the back of that. But MTN has been playing catch up a little bit since then, but has done very well. So Vodacom launched its 5G a couple of months ago. Now MTN, here is the kind of speeds they are offering. So right now you can get better speeds than this, but only because no one's on the network. Once the network is running at full capacity and subscribers have bought the handsets, have bought the packages, these are the kind of speeds you're gonna get. On your mobile phone, you're going to get about 50 megabits per second. That's sort of the equivalent of a fiber optic line into your home, a good one, not just mm -hmm. a cheap ass one, but a good one, 50 megabits per second. It's five times faster than ADSL, remember. Um, the maximum speed is going to be 500 megabits per second. That's far faster than any broadband we're getting in South Africa today. But that's, I think, you know, it'll, it'll peak at those kind of speeds. 50 megabit per second is what you should expect. If you're using 5G at home in a router like Lindsay's situation, you can average speed would be 100 megabits per second. So that's as fast as fiber. I mean, that's what they claim to offer. Whether it will ever pan out that way, we don't know. There are lots of things that affect the signal. The 5G signal is far, far, uh, I'm not going to say weaker. Let's just say it's much more susceptible to interference mm. and that sort of thing. The range is much lower. So where a 4G signal you can measure in kilometers, the um, 5G signal, you almost have to measure in hundreds of meters yeah. because it's, it's a high, high frequency signal that's much more sensitive. So it doesn't just travel around as easily as the traditional cellular signals. So whether we'll have the quality of service that we expect, we don't know yet. No one's really done big 5G adoption. And as far as I know, there are only three or four handsets in the whole country that are doing it right now. So the MTN service launched with... Um, 
Huawei's P40 and P40 Pro, and okay. then LG's Velvet, which is the somewhat more affordable option. It's a wonderful phone, LG's Velvet. It's kind of like, not, I'm not going to say a mid-range phone, it's an upper mid-range phone, but with 5G capability. However, um, the other 5G phones we're aware of are LG's V50 and V60, which are also yeah. in the market, uh, not available from MTN, but that's what else you could do. And then I there's think they, the usual... they are pushing V60 um, on, on, on the... Like on MTN. Later, yeah, um, later on, oh. uh, Velvet is coming whenever, I think Velvet launches next week in our market. Uh, yeah, that's right. 14 that's... grand, 13999. Oh, that's, which is... that's not mid-range. That's uh, for 5G, man. That's good pricing. Like I'm, I'm sorry wow. to pitch 5G. This is why I had that heartfelt apology because 5G <laughs> is becoming an essential, like future-focused service. Like it's mm. more so than what like those high refresh, high refresh rate screens are, because those are just like trash. <laughs> like don't uh, don't pay extra okay. for high refresh rate screens, but pay extra for 5G. And like I, I, I said it in my in my my further review of of the Samsung Galaxy S20 on on that opinion guide.co.za, um, that 5G could have been the difference. It could have been like just extra added value to justify that high price on those devices. But our local S20s don't have the, the 5G radios equipped in them or even on board. Um, there's some hardware swapperoos that Samsung has to do there. Mm. But Velvet is an interesting thing because the part two of what we were going to do out on the beach while having an ice cream um, was look yes. at each other lovingly in, 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 in <laughs> like, make direct contact, um, eating the ice cream and discussing <laughs> the differences between <laughs> LG's kind of hardware approach right now. Because you have the V60, I have the G8X. They both mm -hmm. shipped with the the add-on screen, so the second screen, and we both got very excited about it. I got very excited about it a couple of months back on this podcast, and I mm. hate it. <laughs> also, it's very unfair. <laughs> it's had a quiet taste. Understand. It's like olives or whiskey or whatever. It's had a quiet <laughs> taste. <laughs> Neither of us managed to acquire it so far, though. So. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm just tired um, of LG putting out products into the market um, that are gimped in various ways. Like the V series, I, I've That's noticed. Very That's very unfair. That's very unfair. That's strong words. Uh, okay. Uh, the, the camera performance on the G8S versus G8X in particular are different. There's, mm. there's um, a slightly different lens that's sitting on, on, the, on the G8S, where the G8S then has the face unlock stuff and like all the speeds mm. and power and everything that you need. Yes. Um, but then without the quad deck, and then the G8X comes and loses <laughs> all the, the facial recognition things, um, brings in a weird 32 megapixel um, front facing camera, which can do 4K, yes, yes. then brings in like the proper G8 spec rear cameras, um, brings back the quad deck, and then just kind of gimps everything else. <laughs> like, <laughs> Okay. The, the, the USB port, for instance, the Type C port, uh, it's a, like a weird 2.0 spec um, where it doesn't do really. Um, I was not aware of that. So I was not aware of that. Really? I wow. Put it into my Samsung Dex dock. Um, it just uh. does nothing. It charges, um, but it does really? nothing else. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure I connected my 8x to my monitor, and I'm sure it brought up a screen. I'm sure it did. It actually yeah. brought up the monitor as the second screen, which is very cool. I, mean, I, I, I I can't I can't do it through through a hub, which is kind oh, of the problem okay. that I have right now. Well, yeah. you are trying to push it through a Samsung hub. However, um, um, you've kind of very neatly segued off into a discussion about the LG phones, but I, I thought it might be worth for the listeners quickly just running through some of the 5G pricing before we progress any further. Can I do that yeah. just very quickly? Yes, go for um, it. Just because I think that's a, that's a part most people are interested in. So, um. The MTN CEO said a couple of things. One of the things he said was he is no longer interested in selling data megabit by megabyte um, by gigabyte by gigabyte. He now wants unlimited packages. And I understand yeah. why. I mean, I think he feels that, you know, if, if broadband's ever going to be a proper utility and we're ever going to use it freely, we must be able to not be counting the gigabytes. So I hope that he does actually get to a place where all the packages are simply unlimited and uncapped packages. But until then, here's roughly what you can expect to pay. Um, uh, for a 200 gig package, you're gonna pay about a thousand Rand. That's not cheap. Um, no. What's that? That's 50 Rand a gig. That's roughly what you're paying today if you go and buy a standalone gig. 
you know, and that's with a two month, two year contract. So if you could take a two year contract on 200 gigs a month, you're going to pay a thousand rand, 50 rand a gig. And then the packages vary slightly. If you take less than 200 gig, it costs a little more than 50 rand a gig. If you take more than 200 gigs, it costs a bit less than 50 rand a gig. But that's roughly what you're going to expect to pay until you get to 500 gigs, which is 1,600 rand a month on a two year mm. contract. The two year contract thing itself is a bit problematic. So much yeah. stuff now is done without these damn contracts. I don't know why they're locking people in especially on something like cellular technology that changes so quickly all the time. So yeah. these are the packages probably you're going to use for your home connectivity. So Lindsay typically is going to be on, I'm going to figure on this 300 gigabyte a month package here. So Lindsay typically a serious user, a fairly heavy user would be 1,200 Rand a month. That's for a household of four with seven or eight devices at least running. You're going to pay 1,200 Rand a month which is not that unreasonable because that is almost what I'm paying my ISP for fiber connectivity. So there it is, 1,200 yeah, grand for so, a heavy user per month for so great what's, speeds. What's, what's telling about the, the MTN connection is that it's a sub six um, connection. So I think their fastest bandwidth is, oh, I forget. <laughs> um, but okay. yeah, it's, 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 the, it's the new radio one. So it's like the, the LTE kind of, um, fork of 5g where you, you're getting okay. larger range but you're getting like slower speeds um where that package is exactly the same or at least that service is almost exactly the same to what the rain is has rolled out and the rain for a thousand bucks you getting 100 megabits per second line um unlimited so there's that <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, there is that. But again, again, rain's kind of all very bold when the line is uncontested. They've only got yeah. two people using that service, so that's yeah. fine. As soon as they've got 200 people on the service, it's not going to be fine anymore. Either the price is going to go up or the speed's going to go down, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in, okay, in, in, I mean. Yeah, fine, I, I love I love the fact that they, they, they're spreading the 5G love out there and it's getting into the hands of ordinary people. Um, yes. Talking about ordinary people, Gavin, there was something very disturbing that Anonymous, um, you know, the, the activist group, Anonymous. Yes. Uh, they put out a tweet last night or yesterday in US time uh, that delete TikTok now. If you know someone mm. who's using it, explain to them that it, that it is essentially malware operated by the Chinese government running a massive spying operation. So you can go over to really? the- Really? Chinese spying operation? Who would have thought? See, <laughs> there's, a, there's a developer <laughs> called Dan Okopnir. Uh, <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> yeah. I feel like making you say it again, it was so funny. <laughs> And he was saying that a guy on Reddit reverse engineered TikTok and he found that the data collected on you, that's far worse than just stealing what's on your clipboard. Like it, I, I went through the thread, he, TikTok are going in there, they are actively farming how you're using your phone, where you're connecting to, your contacts, everything. That Really? And, yeah, and it's just pinging back to the servers and they use software that like kind of hides that pinging from mm. other something so like you probably have to like unlock the app and like reverse engineer it to see exactly what they're doing and it's really not on yes i understand there'll be a lot of people who'll be saying yo i don't care if like some a group of people in china can see like what uh -huh. I'm, I'm i'm doing on my phone and who my friends are but um there's there's a projection here um talking about like marketing where they're using the data now, like on the teenagers and kids who are on there, who they- That's prime, they can, prime data, yeah. Mm -hmm. They can then use to build in their marketing strategies um, going forward so that like Chinese companies and services will become like the preeminent thing in everybody's minds. It's, it's, just, sure. it's just disgusting. There's also been horrible stories about- um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to call you out there. You, yeah. you can't just call this disgusting in the first place. Have you put on your fake news filter? Okay, because <laughs> yeah. if, you were, if you were Facebook and you owned Instagram and WhatsApp, you'd be terribly nervous about TikTok. In fact, if you were Google, you'd be super <laughs> nervous about TikTok. As we explained, these guys came out of nowhere, launched straight into the stratosphere. They are pulling in revenue that now sits between Instagram and YouTube. 
That's how yeah. much revenue these guys are pulling. Okay, so they're a serious global player in the first place. In the second place, everyone's super paranoid about China. So it's easy to just tap into that kind of paranoia. You took the bait, okay, <laughs> on the one hand. On the other hand, don't think that the other companies are not doing it. No, they're um, not, but they're not and, doing it to the extent that TikTok well, that's, is doing it, and they're not actively well, trying to hide it. Well, we don't know that for sure. And anyway, um, I, I, w I wouldn't just go with one person's account of the stuff. Uh, we know that they're all mining all our data all the time. TikTok's only been around for like two years or something like that. Think of how much data Google has mined off of you over the 20 years, over 25 years, longer actually. No, 20 years or so they've been around. I mean, think of how much data they've taken off you. TikTok is catching up. They've only got two years. They've got to be a bit more aggressive about the plan. And... You know, I mean, if you think that you're not the product at this point, you're an idiot, okay? <laughs> there is no security. There is no safety. Okay, just live a good, pure life as I do, and you'll have nothing to fear. <laughs> uh, just, just to interject there, like, I, I am aware of, of what other people are doing, and this guy's done his homework. He's re or done the same treatment to all the other services and realized sure. that they're not doing, the, they're not covering up the fact that they're stealing the data as as TikTok is doing, and they're not stealing data to the level that TikTok is doing. Well, um, but that's because said, those, those American apps are kind of accountable in a different way. They're being held yeah. accountable for privacy, privacy stuff. Chinese regime, not accountable for privacy stuff. Why would they spend money trying to cover it up when they don't have to? They're not being held accountable for it by their own government, whereas they are in the US and in Europe and everywhere else. Yeah. They're, they're only covering it up because they're obliged to cover it up by law. You know, it's actually more heinous to it to to um to not be covering it up because you know it's like anyway okay let's not be beating up on tiktok just yet i mean all social media is evil it is a time suck and it's really just designed to siphon off important information about you fortunately nothing about me is important at all so <laughs> i'm safe <laughs> so that's where i'm going to just state my personal bias i'm all about right. um the value exchange and I believe that the data that I offer up to Google actually does help me in my professional life. Um, my search mm -hmm. results are far better because of all of the data that has been mined off of me. Yeah, and understand yeah. like what level of research I need to do and they unearth me information that is topical and needed at the time. Facebook allows me to stay up to date with everybody's birthdays, <laughs> who I miss because I'm very bad at doing that. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, I need, yeah, yeah. I, I just don't find much value in, in TikTok right now, except like for a little bit of a laugh before I go to bed. Uh, but yeah, that that's just me. Moving on, just keep yourself safe, guys. Just try and not give away everything. And we're just slipping okay. other things that people need to know. Uh, Samsung is touting itself. I saw the press release come out earlier this week all about, yes, we've built in this wonderful software into our chargers. Those chargers have to be running all the time so that when you plug in, your phone that it just keep starts charging immediately. Um, I am fully against that sort of, okay, backstory. There was a leak that came out that the iPhone 12 will not have a charger or headphones in the box. People are freaking out about this, but I posed the question <laughs> to you, Gavin. When last have you actually charged a phone with the charger that came in the box? Um, I don't. I just mix it. We've got a whole charge station in our house, which was built for me by my brother-in-law. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wooden box. We can put five chargers in there and the cables all trail out. So I've got all the different kinds of HDMI, I've, well, all the different kinds of USB charging, Apple charging, all these things. So no one really knows what charger they're using. I just find the chargers with the highest amperage output. So minimum two amps and up put them yeah. in there so i have no idea what charge i'm using with what phone and that's the way we like it here mm. okay so like these fast charging and those sort of things um those are quite dangerous like for long well not dangerous they they degrade your long-term battery health very quickly because you're like shoving a whole lot of energy into that battery um, right. at, at rates that it's it wasn't amperage, really, right yeah the, the it's my amperage or wattage or both uh, yeah. watt, wattage wattage is the is the the talk of the the power <laughs> world right yeah so if yeah. amperage is how fast you are punching wattage is how hard that punch is falling sure yeah so okay. and your point is that 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 actually exhausts your poor little battery yeah yeah so i i love the fact that on the xperia one mark two 
um, Sony are always leading the charge when it comes to adopting new technologies that they're using this thing where like if like I have my Samsung S10 in the cradle now, the Dex dock, um, and it's just charging away all the time, just running hot. And then Sony actually have a way where they will use power straight to power whatever you're doing and not actually charge the battery. And they charge the battery at the trickle rate slower while you're doing other things. I see. It just feeds yeah. straight through. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so, okay. So, so Samsung has done what now? Um, they are talking about all the software that they do using now to regulate um, the energy use of the chargers, uh, that they don't run the chargers when they're not plugged in, for instance. And they're doing a lot of recycling, using a lot of recycled, what's it, post-consumer materials. Yes, um, yes, to in, make the in, chargers themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, which is so that's not just plastic. That's yeah, it's not just plastic. It's metals as well. So I think the copper windings yeah. and the, the lead soldering, all that stuff. They're using reclaimed stuff. They claim to have used something like five uh, thousand five tons, tons, of, tons, yeah. tons reclaimed. of reclaimed material, plastics and metals and stuff to make the chargers going forward. Yeah, which is quite impressive. Yeah. So they are saying that they have saved approximately 13 million kilowatts of energy since 2014. But this is the same company, much like Huawei and much like every other company right now that's chasing that magic dragon of the fastest charge possible, that is saying, yeah. hey, we have these, this super fast um, wireless charging and you can wireless charge your devices from the back of our phone and yeah. all of these things. And wireless charging is the most inefficient, inefficient way to put power into something like it's up to i think they've brought it down now to 65 percent of it is lost through heat um and Jeez. that is not good for your batteries either you either, don't want yeah. batteries so, getting like super hot so yeah super so the thing with electricity the worst thing you can do the thing with electricity is that you're constantly losing it from the minute it leaves the wall sockets, usually through the cables. So if you're using a power bank, for example, I think you're, using, you're losing something like 20% of the capacity of the power bank just in the, in the cable getting to your phone. Same with, you know, wherever you plug that cable in, you're losing 10% of the power coming through. Um, yeah. um, but what was my point? Um, uh, okay, I've lost my point. Well, this this to, to get the 13 million kilowatts that Samsung claims to be saving worldwide, they claim that's like five hydroelectric power plants. I think that's an outrageous claim. Imagine, you know what the size of an electric power plant is. They claim that they're saving five of those. It's these huge water turbines, these dams of water. They claim that, you know, by making more efficient charges, although if you multiply it by billions of users, yeah. maybe. You know, yeah. but even no, then, I, I, I think we must scale that, that down a bit. Mm. Again, I'm I'm saying everybody gives Apple crap for like shipping yeah. the, the crappy little trickle charger in the in the lower end devices and not mm. having 50 watt freaking wireless charging or whatever. And it's like, mm, yeah. like these guys understand that people are using these devices for a long time. Uh, they're trying to 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 conserve the the battery health um, going forward, so you can hang on to your device longer. Um, okay. And then they also saving the planet by using more efficient ways of of getting getting that energy into your battery. Like okay. my my thing is always if everybody on the planet who owns a smartphone had to start wireless charging tomorrow, Ooh. the the power drain would be fifty percent more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just to remind you. Lindsay's scientific opinion, which I'm sure is backed by facts, having been the former editor of Popular Mechanics, is that when you do wireless charging, which means when you put your phone down on a surface and it charges through that surface, you're losing 65% of all the electricity coming through that charger. You're just losing to heat into the air, basically. Only a tiny amount of that's making it into the phone. Um, I do think that wireless charging is the future. We see it coming up in cars, for example. More and more cars have just got a pad where you leave your phone lying to charge. And I think we're going to see wireless charging built into office furniture of the future and even counter kitchen counters. Everywhere you put your phone down, everywhere you put your phone down, it will charge, but wildly inefficient at the moment. So, okay, so can I just get your verdict on if Apple ships its next few iPhones with no charges in the box? What are we going to say? We are going to say, we understand why you're doing this, Apple, and this is a good idea. 
because people can use their old chargers from before. Yeah. Or in fact, they can use any charger. They just need an Apple connector at the end of that charger. Um, yeah. So on the so one hand, just, on the other uh, hand, on the other hand, you know that Apple Apple is probably going to charge you fifty dollars to buy an Apple charger. You know yeah. that obviously, right? <laughs> <laughs> but remember last year when they got in hot water with the EU, um, where the EU were oh, like, yeah. "Hey guys, um, e waste and all those sorts of things." This yeah, is the yeah. way they're getting around that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm all for it because of the reduction of e waste. Um, I'm one of the people I use third party chargers. I have a, a much like you, I have a whole thing on my bed stand Bank which has bed. wireless yeah. charging pad, which i use every single night i'm a terrible person my wife yes. also charges pretty much exclusively wirelessly with her wireless charging pad on her side i am a hypocrite i am yes. a hypocrite <laughs> mm. as um, i say can, can, I, I do. <laughs> can i just make one fundamental point if you're concerned about e-waste e-waste is a huge problem it is the fastest growing waste stream in the world including south africa you don't have to worry about hydroelectric power plants and chargers and things like that. What you need to worry about is making sure your devices last as long as possible. Yes. The quickest way to offset your e-waste is to buy products that genuinely last and stop replacing them before you need to. That also means don't buy the cheapest crap around, which breaks down and gets, get, gets replaced you know, within a year. Buy stuff that lasts is the best way to mitigate e-waste. And on that score, Apple does really well. Most people hang on to their Apple phones until they're kind of falling apart. Yeah. A, because they're so damn expensive, um, but also because they really do, they, they, they wear really well. Okay, yeah. but we can move on. So my, my, my now going on four-year-old, actually my four-year-old now going on five-year-old iPhone SE um, mm. is one of the oldest phones. The 6S is the oldest phone. Um, which is getting iOS 14. So that's like, um, if you go back that far, think about the, what's it, the Samsung Galaxy uh, S7, S6 of that year. S6. Um, S6. Is that even usable yeah. at, at this point? <laughs> Any Android phones? Yeah, from, yeah, from I, I know people are still <laughs> using those. I mean, even serious users are still using those to swear by them. I am busy doing a long-term test with this 6S over here. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, the battery life on this is finished. I mean, it's a couple of hours a day. Basically, it's permanently on charge. This is the 6S that I've been using as a daily driver, just so I can check out the new Apple features and so on. Yeah. Uh, the battery life is down to half a day on this. Hmm. <laughs> but, okay, but I mean, the phone is still running. In every other respect, the phone's running brilliantly, including running the new operating system and everything flawlessly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but moving on, that's enough, moving it's enough on, time for Apple. Uh, because we've spoken about Apple and Samsung, we have to speak about Huawei. Um, App Gallery, wow. <laughs> give me something good about App Gallery. I don't have much good to say about it. I'm still waiting for my P40 for my review. Um, okay. One day, one day they'll send it to me when I stop talking crap about them. So I will excuse myself from this conversation. Stop being so sensitive about it. No, I am... Um... I've, I've been doing a long-term test with the new Huawei phones. You've heard me talk about it several times on this podcast because I believe that um, America locking Huawei out of access to American smartphone products, specifically Google products, has pushed Huawei into developing its own solutions. And I think they're going to come up with the third big smartphone platform. That's after Apple and after Google's Android. Huawei is going to be the third big Apple, the third big um, smartphone platform and how they're doing it is by developing what they call their app gallery which is literally like the google play store or apple's app store um, and uh, we've been skeptical about how they're going to pull that off but i must say they've made a lot of progress in a very short time um, i'll report back one more time on my progress on using huawei's app store and you know therefore the third mobile phone platform but here's some data um, in the last 10 months since they've had these problems with uh, Google and its Play Store, they um, have a user base of 400 million Huawei phone users, 400 million people in 170 countries who have downloaded 1.2 million applications. That's not a whole lot compared to a typical, you know, the iPhone app store, but it's still 400 million people. That's like a lot of people. Okay. And... Um, and now those people are obviously going to be downloading a lot more apps. So 
uh, while we bravely, and I say bravely in air quotes, launched the P40 here, even though consumers who buy a P40 really have no idea what they're getting into when they don't have Google services on their phone. You'd be amazed how much you take for granted that on your Android phone, all this Google stuff just works. When you take it away, you get in a bit of a sort of a flutter and a bit of a panic. I'm trying to help people by hand holding them through that process. Um, but, you know, 400 users, um, uh, let's see. Oh, I'm, I'm seeing here in my notes that although 1.2 million applications have been downloaded, uh, while we says that 390 billion downloads have occurred of what? I don't know. Sorry, I seem to have lost some of my own data here. I'll have to come back to you with that information. But what I'm saying is that while we has the clout and the numbers to in one step become the third phone platform, and in fact, that's on the cover of the next tech magazine is the story of how I believe that's going to happen and why I support that view, whether or not I support Huawei's platform or not is another thing. I support the idea of a third player. Mm. And in fact, I think it's entirely appropriate it should be a Chinese player because we laugh about TikTok versus you know Facebook selling our data. But the truth is these American companies have colonized the internet. Basically the entire internet has been characterized by American technologies. I think that's very misleading. It, it's a kind of cultural imperialism for want of a better phrase. And it'd be more interesting to see the Asian influence on the internet and in the smartphone world that's been dominated by American concerns so far. So I'm all for that, frankly. I think we must all open our minds a bit. So let's see yeah. how Wow how, how does with that. I, I definitely, I did, and I apologize for my dog barking in the background. It is dirt <laughs> <one> day. <laughs> <laughs> we have that too, we have that too. Jeez, the neighbors hate us. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> So yeah, I, I I applaud them for 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 the gumption and the effort. Um, they've spent a hell of a lot of money on on marketing. They're pushing it. The production quality has been really yeah. high, also with a lot of the ads that they're putting out in the South African market. Um, they they're doing a stellar job. They they definitely swimming against the tide. Um, I oh against the stream. Sorry. <laughs> Mixed metaphor early in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the coffee's wearing off, Kevin. The mm. yeah, I, I I can definitely see the value that they that that, that they are adding on on that side for for themselves. But yeah, I still can't with a clean conscience um, advise anybody to walk that path, um, especially that I haven't walked it myself completely without without Google services. Uh, but yeah, moving on, Kevin, how to <sighs> spell correct? <sighs> I have a constant battle. With, okay, here, here's a backstory. So <laughs> Microsoft's yeah. default anything. So if I bring a Windows laptop into my house, I try to print to my wireless printer, everything kind of works fine. But the default setting on Microsoft things are like so US centric. <laughs> that it's funny. Uh -huh. so like, okay, okay. Print, what do you mean? Like example. And not a fault. Oh. And to change that is a fight that no human should have with technology <laughs> and then it comes okay. to spell check as well so i i mean we've been i've been i've been a journalist i've been a professional wordsmith for over a decade and i use microsoft word and every time i try and set my computer language to like south africa english south africa and then use a spell check that doesn't americanize everything like there's a problem with every single update. Like I have to go back in and go back and change like default settings. And it's just a nightmare. And now there's a Microsoft, what's it called? Editor, which is the new spell checker that they're using across their browsers, across everything. If you're on a Windows machine, talk us through it, Kevin. How do we yeah. correct our spelling? Um, it's not a super big deal. It's not a highly complex maneuver to pull off, but it is jolly useful. So Microsoft Editor is basically like the old spell checker, kind of, but a bit on steroids. So now it's checking your grammar. It's checking all sorts of things as you go along in MS Word, which is where most people do their writing. But increasingly, people are writing inside their browser because so many more applications now run in the browser, including, you know, Microsoft's own web apps and Google's apps and so on all run in the browser. So and for that matter, you could be on Facebook posting long screeds of text. Who knows? So Microsoft has now embedded that same functionality inside its Edge browser, which you can turn on 
through the settings. So you can turn on the Microsoft editor and you can set it for South African English so that if you want to use words like biltong and lekker, well, no, mm. lekker is an Afrikaans word technically, but um, you know, you, you can actually have your grammar and spelling and all that sort of thing checked inside the browser. So um, typically, I think Facebook is the place where I'm typing really fast and Twitter for that matter. I'm typing really fast. It's easy for things to go wrong. And once you've sent out that tweet, it's really hard to recall it and fix the horrible typo yeah. you've got in there. So to have the browser checking your stuff is actually jolly useful. So poke around in your Microsoft Edge browser, which is the browser that Lindsay and I are big fans of at mm -hmm. the moment. Um, turn on the Microsoft editor, which is the spell checker on steroids, which checks grammar, spelling, and other sort of details of what you're writing. It actually mm -hmm. suggests phraseology and stuff. So if you've got tautological tautologi writing, <laughs> yeah, tautological <laughs> writing or other kinds of uh, bad syntax, um, it attempts to correct you and handhold you through those things as well. So good luck with that. Okay, just improve yeah. your writing. I mean, even though Lindsay and I have been writing professionally almost our entire working lives, it's amazing how many things, you know, you, you have blind spots about your own writing. So this kind of thing does point them out. You can choose to accept their suggestions or not, but at least they're there. Okay. Yeah, so uh, on that point, um, Microsoft also owns a company, or at least owns a technology company called SwiftKey. They do mobile keyboards. I use SwiftKey extensively. Yes. Um, so I think that's also now being powered by the same engine that powers um, Editor. Um, it's very good, except that I got a Gmail notification. Um, oh, yes, I also got that. I was going to put that in our notes. It's not yeah. allowed to <clears> take. <throat> Um, data from <clears throat> Gmail anymore. So what SwiftKey does is it learns your writing. You can like plug in all your services and it will scan whatever you're doing there and keep learning and keep using like the words that you usually use or at, 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 at the AI just learns how you how you type. Um, and now you cannot harvest data from Gmail anymore. So that's that's quite important. It's but, weird that, when that they say, would play that game. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we both SwiftKey fans uh, just to recap what Lindsay is saying, SwiftKey learns how you type, what words you use, and it learns that by scanning your email and your social media posts and all the stuff you type on your phone. So it, it learns that you use certain phrases a lot and certain acronyms and that kind of thing. And so it, it helps correct those things as you go. SwiftKey was then acquired by Microsoft. Um, but what's advantageous is every time I set up a new cell phone and I install SwiftKey, I can tell it to use my Google sign-in, which allows it to then go and find um, the cloud data of the dictionary of words and, and writing style that I've been using all along. So it doesn't have to relearn each time. You know, it builds on what I, what I was doing on the previous phone. And now Google, for some reason, doesn't want to allow it to do that anymore. Uh, it claims because the system that Microsoft uses for fetching that dictionary of the words and phrases each time is insecure. So we'll see how that goes. What is true is that maybe SwiftKey has become very popular and possibly is replacing Google's own keyboard in more cases than they're comfortable with, so they've decided to clamp on them, but we don't really know. Um, I'm surprised that Microsoft allowed that to happen to them, actually. Mm. Yeah, I think they're they... blindsided by that. I think that's a fight uh -huh. um, between the two corporations on, on a different level. I do think okay. SwiftKey is far better than Gboard. Um, I'm not a big fan yeah. of Gboard just because they don't have a keyboard layer that I like. I like my special characters like tag to um, the the alpha characters. So okay. Like that mm -hmm. Gboard just doesn't have a layout that supports that, which is very irritating. And then that brings us to Gavin. If you're writing a lot, you probably doing something like just standard work, um, just normal, like sending emails, that sort of thing, or you're a student taking notes, putting together theses. I have, I'm currently finishing up my review on the Lenovo IdeaPad C340. The mm. model that I have on test is the Core i5 8th generation processor with four gigs of RAM and 256 gig SSD. That is not the one you should buy at uh, tech trade, my tech treasure at least for for ordinary people who just want to do ordinary things on a computer not push it too hard not want to like create like mad content like editing a lot of video and stuff but if you just want something that works that will probably work with you for a long time um maybe four or five years the warranties on lenovo products are three years now which is 
absolutely amazing and the aftermarket service is quite good um just delete the bloatware the moment you get it because you don't need a lot yeah. of those things um, is the idea pad c340 with the 10th gen core i3 uh 256 gigs ssd and four gigs of ram that is going for 14,000 rand now i like 13,000 rand 12 triple nine at incredible connection right now and if you spend 400 rand more and 17,000 and you can up spec to the 10th gen core i5 and 8 gigs of ram and double your storage as well that's that's my tech treasure for that okay but you're talking about a 14,000 rand laptop here and you you said that in the same sentence as if you just want to do some typing and stuff i mean <laughs> surely if you're going to spend 14,000 rand you want to do a lot more than typing and stuff if you want to type and stuff you can spend eight grand and get a perfectly de reasonable laptop so i don't know where you're coming from the old privilege <laughs> showing again bro so maybe th did i misunderstand you or is that what you said i mean uh, for your 14 kind of grand i, I would said. expend I would expect quite a lot of laptop for my 14 grand. I'd expect it to weigh in the region of two kilograms or less, Which you know, has. and so on and so on. It has yes, a okay, because that's what stylus. I'd expect for that You get a stylus money. in the box as well for free. Um, you, you get an Apple <laughs> stylus in the box. So there's Windows Ink. It's a two-in-one. It flips around 180 degrees. You can use it as a tablet. Okay. Decent speakers. Um, Dolby Audio, although the Dolby name has been sullied by the tech. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Them and the others as well. Harman Kardon's been done in Bang & Olufsen. All of their, all of their speaker integrations on laptops have been dreadful. Um, uh, okay, just give us, give us that Lenovo product reference again. That's the IdeaPad oh. C340. Yeah. Um, you are looking for the Core i5. No, the Core i3, the 10th gen, with four gigs of RAM and 256 gig SSD. So it has a fingerprint sensor, HD, or at least 720p webcam, really good um, keyboard with backlighting. Right. And it's a, and it's a, a good, good all-rounder. Yeah, it's a, a good all-rounder. Like, I've had the Flex 14, which this is kind of, it shares a lot of design cues um, with it. I know they are Flex devices as well, but my Flex 14 I bought way back in 2014. And like my daughter sure. still does really well on it to, to do a schoolwork. Like it's going to last you a long time and that warranty is really good. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I'm busy exploring entry-level laptops. I've, I've gone through a range of entry-level gaming laptops. More information about that shortly. But a model that I actually have not yet used, but I'm very keen to use, is from Asus. Asus is kind of one of my new favorite brands mm -hmm. at the moment. Not just because, but because I've now had a couple of their products, all of which impressed me. That's what it takes to sway me. And um, their entry level is called the E-Series. They've got three models there, the E210, uh, the E410, and the E510. And these models are all around sort of the five to 7,000 Rand, but they look nice and slimline. Obviously, they're all plastic bodies and so on. But these are great entry level models. And I'll be looking forward to trying out some of those over the next few weeks. This is the E series from ASUS. I think you're going to find reliable, low end workhorse PCs mm. in that lot. That's the E210, the 410, and the 510. So I'm looking forward to trying those. Um, before that, Lindsay's favorite model, which is also one of my favorite models, around the 5,000 Rand mark was the Acer uh, Spin 1. Uh, spin 1, yeah. yeah. Which is also a convertible where the lid flips around mm. and you know, becomes a thick tablet. That was a great simple writing tool. My biggest limitation there is 11-inch screen, which is really tiny. It's fine if you're just sitting in a coffee shop and you're sending a few emails. But yeah. if you're trying to type a thesis, you're not going to do it on, the, on an 11-inch screen. You're going to want to plug in some peripherals. So give that some thought. Um, I'll have to come back to you on on uh, favorite laptops of the moment. I've been seeing a lot of them. Uh, one of them is the HP NV X360. Uh, I'm going to have to come back to you on more details about that because I'm still in the middle of a test on that. So that's an ultra book, which means it's extremely thin and light. Also comes with an active stylus. A lot yeah. of fun to use so far. So I'll come back to you on details. Yeah, cool. about I... Next week. Mm. Two in one, all the things, Gavin. And that is my story. I am Lindsay Shooters, Sharpshooters on social media, S-H-A-R-P-S-C-H-U-T-T-E-R-S. That Opinion Guy on the internet, thatopiniongui.co.za is the website, That Opinion Guy on YouTube. Gavin, what's going on in your world? I got to get out of here. My daughter needs to get to school. <laughs> sure. We all need to sort of start our work day. Thank you very much for getting me out of bed before the, before the cock crowed this morning. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I'm the specialist product writer on Tech Radar website, techradar.com. If you go there, it'll automatically send you to the South African version. Excellent coverage, not just of news, but very specifically about products. And look for our best of lists, best Bluetooth speakers, best laptops, best phones. It's all there on techradar.com. And of course, I'm still the editor of Tech Magazine, the biggest consumer electronics publication in the country. So do pick up on all those. We're busy working on our specialized gaming edition, which will coincide with the virtual version of the annual Rage Gaming Expo. So we're busy working on that at the moment. This year, our focus is on budget conscious gaming. So the best stuff to invest in for gaming, not the cheapest, but the best stuff to spend money on that lasts for a really long time and gets you great performance. That's my story. Max Q. Cheers. Okay, cheers. <laughs> All right, be safe out there. Max Q. <laughs>